How many of you are between the ages of 8 and 108? Raise your hands. Oh, yes, I finally nailed the demographic. Awesome. So what is molecular literacy, and how can it be learned by those between the ages of 8 and 108? And why is this an idea worth sharing? Let's start with how the idea of molecular literacy was born. Quite some time ago, okay, well, <laughs> a very, very, very long time ago, the loudspeakers went off in the middle of my seventh grade English class with a muddled announcement that sounded something like, school is closing because it's raining radiation. Of course, that was not the exact message. But what did we do? We cheered. And then we ran to the windows and we flung them open and we put our heads out and we searched the skies for this magical and mystical raining radiation. This wild rumpus was soon brought to an abrupt halt by our teacher. She asked us to step away from the windows and put us in a straight line to our buses. However, <laughs> the wild rumpus continued on the bus. We opened those windows and put our heads out like joyful dogs, still searching for this raining radiation. And when we got to our bus stop, our driver instructed us to take our jackets and put them over our heads to protect ourselves from, get this, nuclear fallout. I can assure you none of our jackets were made of lead. When I got home, I burst through the door and I proclaimed, school is closed, maybe forever, it's raining radiation, and this is the best day ever. Nobody heard me. My whole family was watching the news. So I walked over, sat down, started watching the news too. There was a reporter on the news, her name was Barbara Walters. And she was saying things like nuclear meltdown, cooling towers, radioactive particles. It sounded like a foreign language. But then she said, at the Three Mile Island Nuclear Power Plant. Oh, I knew where that was. That's just like over the river. And you can finish my sentence through the woods, yes, <laughs> if you were thinking that. So close to home, how exciting. So I asked my parents, I said, hey, What's going on? And they replied, it's very serious and we may need to evacuate. But why? I asked. Because, they replied. That because changed my life. This was my experience in March of 1979 with the near nuclear accident at the Three Mile Island nuclear power plant. Several things stuck with me from that experience. The first is that because is not an explanation. The second is I became curious. What are these evil, invisible enemies that we call radioactive particles and chemicals? And third, I wanted to answer questions about the world with science instead of because. And then it motivated me to become a chemistry professor. I still remember my first day as I was about to walk into class with 200 students in an auditorium. Surely I was going to change their lives. And as I walked into the auditorium and I scanned their faces, quickly realized they were not looking at me like the superhero I thought I was, but instead more like a super villain of sorts. Kind of like a female Darth Vader. This happened year after year after year after year, and I was so perplexed. 
Why do my students think chemistry is so hard? <laughs> Recent data shows that 50% of all college students fail, drop, or withdraw a chemistry course. It is arguably the most failed and most feared course on a college campus. And it's a prerequisite to over 50 STEM college majors. Raise your hands if you or someone you know has ever had to abandon their dreams because of a chemistry course. Higher. <laughs> Yikes. It shouldn't be like this. It doesn't have to be like this. So I decided to do something about it. I did research, years of research. I wrote books and articles, lots of books and articles. And after 25 years, I finally came to the answer that brought me here today. Students are coming to college and for the most part are molecularly illiterate. So what is molecular literacy? Molecular literacy begins with teaching chemistry like teaching reading and provides a basic understanding of our world on a molecular level. So my research has shown that learning chemistry is like learning reading. And if you use the same strategies for teaching chemistry that you do for teaching reading, you can build molecular literacy. So what are these strategies and how do they parallel those we use to teach reading? Well, the first and probably most important is to begin at an early age when a child's brain has the neuroplasticity to under understand and interpret symbolic information. We teach the alphabet to three-year-olds. We can teach the alphabet of science, otherwise known as the periodic table, to third graders. We know that literacy takes time and practice. We now know that molecular literacy takes time and practice. Can you imagine if we've taught the alphabet to kids starting in high school or college? That's precisely what we're doing with chemistry. We're delaying learning, cramming it in, and expecting the miracle of mastery. We can change this. Now, I know what you're thinking, really? It may seem formidable at first. How can an eight-year-old learn chemistry? Well, I remember that same feeling of overwhelm as a new mom. How is my son ever going to learn how to read? I knew the stakes were high and I felt an urgency to begin right away. I had a cloth book in front of his face before he could even hold his head up. I scoured garage sales for books, games, toys, anything that would teach him the alphabet and first words. I read to him day and night like his life depended on it. And it was rough. Results were not immediate. But we were having so much fun. We found books that we loved, games that made us laugh, and shows and songs that we still bond over 25 years later. And eventually there was a letter written, a word read. My son was developing literacy. The same strategies can be put in place to build molecular literacy. Okay, now it's your turn. If you all wanna stand up, all right, we got a game, a periodic table. Oh, you are such gamers. You are standing. I wasn't expecting. All right, we're going to play a game, a periodic table twister. Everyone ready to start? No, you sit down. You, this is such a good audience. Props. No one ever stands up. Remember, also, I'm a college professor, so no one ever responds to that. <laughs> Everyone's just looking at me like, no, I'm not doing that. So thank you. Um, anyway. Along the same lines, can you imagine if we had books with characters that were molecules and elements? 
Or what if there were cards and blocks that kids could put together to create chemical formulas, just like they do to create words? Or what if there was an animated series where the main character was a ladybug, and when she opened her wings, there was a periodic table on the inside? Or maybe what if, what if there were songs that were catchy and fun, like, I don't know, like, um, sweet calcium, bum, 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 spinach never tastes so good, so good, so good. Thank you. <laughs> and what if I told you I spent the last five years working on these tools? I have, including Periodic Table Twister. My research has shown that these tools are effective, fun, engaging, and build a strong foundation for molecular literacy. Okay, now it really is your turn. No twisting involved, though. You're good. Okay. But it is your turn, and it may seem like mission impossible, but it's mission molecular literacy. <laughs> and your mission, should you accept it, and you will because you're sitting there, so you have to accept this mission, <laughs> is to restore the fading colors in a Van Gogh painting. You see, understanding molecules isn't just about preventing disasters. It's also about preserving beauty, like in art restoration. So your task will be to restore the colors in Van Gogh's Starry Night painting. This is based on a recent case study where a handful of Van Gogh's paintings were found to have faded or changed color over time due to their interactions with light and oxygen. In fact, what art historians have found is that Van Gogh's original paintings now drift differ dramatically from what he originally painted. Okay, now back to your mission. You're going to be joining Poppy and Ray, those are the green folks up there, and Led Z, who is the lead singer for the heavy metals, of course. You'll be joining the three of them as they discover ways to restore the colors in Van Gogh's Starry Night. Well, how? Right? You'll be using the tools of molecular literacy. So now what do Poppy, Ray, and now you need to know? What are the pigments that Van Gogh used? Some of the bolder blue colors in Starry Night are a pigment called cobalt blue and contain the elements cobalt and oxygen. But here's the best part of your mission. <laughs> so excited. You're going to write a chemical formula for cobalt blue. <gasps> Yay. All right. Yeah. So exciting. All right. Okay. So the first part of this is we have to consult the alphabet of science, which is the periodic table, and find the symbols for cobalt and oxygen. Now, if we only had a periodic table, wait, table? Are you kidding me right now? Look at that. Right there. Let's go. Okay. We got our periodic table. Let's find the symbols for cobalt. Cobalt's right here. Oxygen's around the corner. We've got those. All right, so if we're going to write a chemical formula, we find the symbols first. And then we assemble them much like we assemble a word. So, for example, if we were going to spell the word for cat, we would discover the letters. And the way that children discover the letters when they're reading is to sound out the word. K, C, A, A, T, T. So there's the letters, C-A-T, and then they put them in the correct order to spell the word cat. We're going to use that exact same strategy for creating the formula for cobalt blue. We see that the symbol for cobalt is capital C, little o, and the symbol for oxygen is capital O. Now what is the correct order? Well, the name is cobalt blue, so you might guess that cobalt comes first, and it does. And there's also a rule in chemistry that says metals come first, non-metals come second. Cobalt's a metal, so we write capital C, little o, first. Oxygen's a non-metal, we write that second. And then you have the formula for cobalt blue, 
and it's cobalt 2 oxide. Bravo, congratulations. You just wrote a chemical formula. I know, I'm so proud of you. It's so awesome. And did you just have a little fun doing that? Yeah, good, thank you. Okay, now, do you remember the, um, the main characters in my story? We've got Poppy and Ray. They're green for a reason. They're green because they're radioactive. Poppy is the element polonium. Ray is the element radium. And do you remember what my also, also remember my early fascination with nuclear energy and radioactivity? Yeah, they were, that incident inspired these characters as well. Molecular literacy informs us of what we are made of. It connects us with each other, it bridges divides, it fosters curiosity, and it's a universal language that can bond us with each other and the entire world. Chemistry isn't just science. It is the shared story of everything. Thank you.